going to take a look at section at unit 8 right now. We're talking about the periodic table, some of its historical development and all. You'll find if you read section 2.4, it might help you out in the course of this. Uh, it deals with this sort of a topic. So, <coughs> two, two parts to it. One is the historical development of the periodic table. The other one is the current state of the periodic table that we have at this state, what it looks like at this day and age. And so if we go back into the, let's go back to the 1800s or so, about the mid 1800s, there were about 60 elements that were known altogether. Currently, we have 118, so we're nearly double that now. Uh, due to the various pieces of work that have been done with the laws of definite proportions and multiple proportions, and all, among the other things that we have, uh, the relative masses of the atoms were fairly well known. Uh, that oxygen was eight times heavier than hydrogen, that nitrogen was seven times heavier than hydrogen, that sort of thing. And since science has a tendency toward organization, classification, that sort of thing, it was really necessary to find some sort of way of organizing and understanding these many elements, these 60 elements. And alphabetic listing isn't helpful in terms of understanding. And so we go back to 1816. This is only four years after Dalton's atomic theory and talk about Johann Doberreiner. Uh, and what he noticed is that the elements seem to occur in trios, similar properties. Lithium, sodium, potassium, chlorine, bromine, iodine all appeared to to work together and so these numbers out here the 7, the 23, the 39 those are relative masses. So lithium is 7 times more massive than hydrogen, sodium is 23 times more massive and so on and these guys when you put them in water they form caustic or basic solutions uh, like lye things like that and so when you look at when you look at that development uh, what you find out is that that's some sort of set of some patterns. So we have trios here that are going to be applied. So now let's take a look at what happens next. We go to 1862. Next is probably a stretch, but this is like 50 years later or so. And what we find here is Jean Courtois says, hey, look at if I line them up on this spiral thing, that ones that are vertical, lithium, sodium, and potassium tend to have similar properties, just like carbon and nitrogen have some carbon and uh, sulfur, silicon have different similar properties. So this big spiral thing we have here in this case kind of lines them up and kind of lets us see what we're looking at. And so now, if we go on to the next step, and this is just a year later, John Newland noticed that they actually work in octaves too. That eight elements, that eight elements will tend to every if you line them up according to atomic mass that every eighth element will have similar sorts of properties. If you look at the periodic table today, you'll find fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine are all in the same what we call group. They all have similar properties in there. And so, so it's getting more put together as we move along. And then you come into 1863 or so, which is, I'm sorry, 1868, which is uh, Meyer. And Meyer says, look, if I do this, and line these guys up this way. Here's boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine going down here. That they have similar properties. And uh, actually, no, these guys have progress, have uh, changing properties. They go down here. If I come across here, they have similar properties. Now this is sort of reversed from what we use today. Today we have the columns and the rows opposite of what he's got here. So uh, Meyer comes up with this, but about a year up comes Dmitry Mendeleev, who now is known as the father of the periodic table. And what Mendeleev did was much more, uh, was, gets him much more credit than Meyer gets, is for one thing, he published his results before Meyer did. And for second thing, what we find out is that he's able to take and he arranged them by atomic masses, but if there was a problem, if there was a property that didn't look right, he would take and change that order to fix it. And then he took and actually left holes in places where it didn't seem to be an element. So, uh, for example, in this one, he called it echosilicon, ended up being germanium. His predictions were 72, 5 and a half, 30 grams density, atomic mass, and so on. And over here in germanium, you know, similar properties once it was discovered. So a very powerful periodic table he had, and he was able to uh, predict things that, that nobody else was able to do. And so Mendeleev gets most of the credit. If you go back and think about the historical development in here, you'll find out that <coughs> Mendeleev's periodic table looks a whole lot like ours. So here's here's lithium, here's sodium, here's potassium, here's rubidium, here's cesium, rubidium. The same elements down, it looks very similar to what ours looks at this day and age. It looks very much like your front flap of the book, except it's not quite as readable. And so 
now we take a look here. This is a cartoon. Just to remind you what happened and the significance of this. This is Zitz. I was like Zitz. Mom says, Jeremy, why did you get a D on your chemistry test? And Jeremy says, because I couldn't study for it. And of course, the question is, why couldn't you study for it? And the answer is, because my iPod battery was dead. She kind of stares at him and he says, well, you can't study without an iPod, Mom. And then she says, and yet Mendeleev managed to organize a periodic table. So, you know, we've kind of moved along quite a bit. And we actually do things. Now, uh, today, uh, if you look at historical development of elements, if you go about 1800, 1849, these first few in here, there are about 60 to 80 elements that are known. If you color, change the boxes, and you look at the boxes, add them all up, they have about 60 to 80 of them. And now we're all the way out actually to 118 elements. So it's moved along. It keeps moving along all the time as we look at it. And so, um, that's kind of our basic periodic table background. This is actually what the current IUPAC table looks like. This is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry uh, periodic table. It actually, as I said, comes all the way out to 118 elements now. Uh, we'll see more and more of these as we go along in the course. So that's your background on the periodic table. Uh, you might take a look at that section and see because it's got some kind of interesting things in it.